Good morning, beloved. The word tells us I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, 
Magnify the Lord with me on this day and let us celebrate him for all that he has done in the midst of our lives. My name is Reverend Ori Peterson. I'm the pastor here at Lomax Temple AME Zion Church, and we welcome you to this online worship experience. And we're so glad that you are here via Facebook, via um, YouTube. We're glad that you are here on this occasion. And today's scripture is going to be coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 28. And the theme is, we just got to check ourselves. We will now have the scripture reading and prayer by Sister Veronica Moon Gray, followed by the great choir right here at Lomax Temple, AME Zion Church. Once again, we thank you for being part of this worship experience. And know that God has a word for you on this day. Amen. Good morning, Lomax. On this first Sunday of May, we give God praise and we thank him for his goodness and for his mercy. Because we know that it was him that woke us this morning. We know it was him that started us on our way. We know that it is him that is keeping us today. Our scripture lesson comes from 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. I will begin reading at the 17th verse, and I am reading the NIV translation. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have been, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Oh, we give thanks to God as we examine ourselves as we look within today. Let us pray. Most kind and gracious Lord, we come before you today thanking you, Lord, once again for the privilege, Lord, to come before your throne of grace because Jesus rent the bell. He has given us direct access to you. We come, Lord God, looking within ourselves to see, Lord God, where we need to make changes. We are looking within ourselves, Lord God, because we do not want to take this communion, this Lord's Supper, unworthily. Lord God, we don't want to be divided, but we want to be in harmony with one another. We want to be with one accord 
with one another. We want to be strong and together. So Father, today we come. Lord, we are focusing on you because you said as often as we do this, to do it in remembrance of you. So we take the cup and we take the bread and we give thanks, remembering the sacrifice that you made for each one of us. Lord God, we go forward in praise, in glory, and in honor today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God. And amen.
Amen, beloved. We're so glad that you have joined us here on this Sunday morning, this first Sunday morning of May. We're glad that you are a part of this service. And beloved, we, just a reminder, we're going to be doing communion today at 1 p.m. right outside in our parking lot. So please join us at that time. And we're looking forward to communion and we're looking forward to um, remembrance of what the Lord our Savior has done for us. As well as I look forward to seeing each and every last one of you. So we'll be having communion this Sunday on May 1st, on, on the 1st of May, the first Sunday in May, right here at the church parking lot at 1 p.m. Amen. In the day's text, I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want us to slide down to the latter part on verse 28. And the verse 28 says, simply this it says everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup everyone ought to examine themselves today's message is just we got to check ourselves we have to check ourselves let us pray Oh God, we thank you for all that you continue to do in the midst of our lives, oh God. Oh Lord, I ask that you use me at this time to give a word to your wonderful people, oh God. And God, I pray that their hearts, their minds, their ears receive it. Their feet, hands, and soul begins to move in it. And God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart truly be acceptable Unto you, O oh God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Paul is speaking to the church of Corinth, telling them to examine themselves, informing them that they needed to check themselves. See, it's in Corinth was a large city. It's a city that's part of the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. It's, it's, it's part of these folks. Paul is saying there in his second missionary journey, he's a tent maker. He's working with Priscilla and Aquila. And Paul tax, tactfully opens up this discussion with the praise, when you look at verses two, he's praising them for keeping doing the work, keep on doing the work that he had outlined them to do. But then it begins to do a little bit of a shift when we get to verse 17. He begins this topic and begins to let them know that he's not praising them for what they're doing as it relates to the traditions of the Lord's Supper. See, the, the way they had been behaving, they, it was atrocious now is what they were doing as it came with the Lord's Supper. You need to understand that they was doing more harm now then good see it was a heart problem they had began to cause division in the midst of the church community don't you hear me now it was in the midst of the church community those who are believers those who say that they are worshipers of God those who are saying in this moment of this sacrament this 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 blessed time that now they are divided now they are causing more harm then it is good. See, he reminds them that they have to do a self-check and self-examination, and that needs to happen within the church. See, when I was, when we had church opening and when we began to come here, uh, uh, seems like a long time ago, I, I, I recall Mr. McCray would sit over to my left, yo, yo, right. He, he would look at my beard and every now and then he would remind me maybe 
because it's getting so gray. He reminded me about the outward look that I had, that it was getting a little gray. He joked with me and said, maybe you might need some Grecian formula to go in your beard. He was reminding me, maybe I need to check a mirror to see what was going on. And beloved, we need to understand it's a time that we have to begin to check ourselves. The church is okay with doing self-righteous convictions of others, but we don't do a good job with doing self-examination of ourselves. See, we consider and we can look at all the wrong other folks are doing, but we, when it comes to looking in the mirror at ourselves and doing a self-examination, we have a problem with doing a self-check in that area. See, the healthcare workers, hear me now, the healthcare industry, healthcare workers have no problem with asking you, with asking me, and asking anybody they come in contact with that we need to do some self examinations. We, at times, I remember going to my doctor and he explaining to me about the self-check that I needed to do and understanding there's a belly fat self-check that if your waistline is more than 37 inches around, that, that means he was talking to me at that moment, at that time, that I'm at risk of heart disease. I'm at risk of some cancers. I'm at risk of sleep apnea. It's, I'm at risk of diabetes. I'm at risk of high blood pressure. He was explaining to me I have to do some self-checks about what my waistline looks like. Don't you know that there's some self-checks that we can do because of our Fitbits, because of our smart watches? We can self-check our heart rate, our resting heart rate, and begin to examine it and see if it's over 80 beats per minute. Then that that may mean if that means we're resting at that point, and if it's over 80 beats per minute, that means we might have some potentials of, of cardiac vascular problems that we might need to notify the doctor because of our resting heart rate. So we have to do some self-checks when we look at our own life. The thing about it, the self-checks don't stop there. The heart and, and the, 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 the workers with in the healthcare industry remind us that we also need to do some blood pressure checks now and then. Checking our blood pressure to see if it's over 120 and 80 on a regular basis that might mean or might have some symptoms or we might be at risk of heart attacks, heart failure, strokes, or kidney failure, or some other health consequences. See, the thing about it is we have no problems doing those kinds of self-check and in, in, uh, looking at ourselves. Don't you know that there are some other self-checks that we have to look at our mouths and see if we're bleeding in our gums after we brush our teeth because that could be a sign of some, some issues going on. Don't you know that we should look in the mirror every now and then quite often to see if there's some moles that are growing and um, getting bigger than what we thought it was last year because these blemishes, these freckles, these moles can indicate possibly skin cancer. See, we have no problems when it comes to doing self-examinations as it relates to our health. But the word of God tells us that we have to do some spiritual examinations to see how we stand as it relates to the word of God. See, Paul was informing them that they needed to do some self-checks as it relates to their spiritual walk with God. See, Paul says that they are righteously doing now more harm than doing good. They are religiously doing more harm than good. We can religiously do harm. We can religious. Religious means that that's just something we continuously do day in and day out. They are religiously now doing more harm 
than good. See, that he's telling them they need to do something different now, just like our doctors would tell us that we have to eat better, we have to do some calorie counts, we have to exercise, we have to eat healthier food. Paul was trying to inform them, you need not to divide or to reduce. That's the first thing he's trying to get them to understand. Right now, you're, you're dividing and you are reducing, and you need not to do either or. When we look at verse 17 and verse 18, it says, in the following directive, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than it does good. In the first place, I hear when you come together as a church, there is division. See, it's all about the haves and the have-nots. And then Paul say, and to some extent, I believe it. See, Paul was writing them and letting them know because of some things he had heard and some things he had noticed and some things he had read. He was trying to get them to stop with this division, trying to get them to stop with this reduction. They was doing now more harm than they were doing good. And you need to understand that you can get to a bad place. We can get to a bad place. The Corinthians got to a bad place with the choices that they was making. Now that they're dividing people versus on bringing people together, they are reducing people. That means they're running folks away from the church versus on bringing folks closer to God. See, this happens when we get sidetracked. This happens when we get sidetracked with living with sin. This happens when we overlook or discount sin. This happens when we say, you know what, it ain't that bad in the first place. But Paul was trying to get them to understand that true wisdom. When you look at chapter two, Paul in first Corinthians in chapter two, Paul is saying, guess what? This is a story leading up to chapter 11. He's trying to get them to understand understand when he writes in chapter two, he tells them that there's true wisdom and spirituality truly comes from God. But they thought that true wisdom came from scholarly learning versus higher knowledge that comes truly from God. He's trying to get them to understand there's nothing wrong with having scholarly knowledge. It's nothing wrong with going to school to get your um, associate's degree, to get your bachelor's degree, to get your master's degree, to get your doctorate degree. It's nothing wrong with that because that helps you, that improves you, that helps to develop the skill that you're trying to learn in but don't get it wrong don't get it twisted don't think that that knowledge is outweighing the knowledge and wisdom that comes from God see Paul was trying to get them to understand that in chapter 2 but yet they kept leaning on their own understanding and we, the word tells us we need to lean not to our own understanding but in all thy ways we got to give it unto God in chapter 3, Paul is informing them to apply godly principles when it comes to doing God's work. We got to apply godly principles when it comes to doing God's work. Understanding that work is not the thing that saves us. We, we're not working to be saved. That's, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But we can do godly kind of work because we need to understand that faith without works is dead. We're not working to be saved, but we're working because we're so thankful that we are saved. See, he, Paul was giving them instructions on how they ought to do godly work in chapter six, five. And then in chapter six, we, when we look at this, see, Paul is trying to get them to somewhere because before we can get to communion, there's some things we need to be walking in, talking in, and doing. You wonder why I'm going through these chapters because the thing about it, we try to rush to communion so fast that we don't know what God desires for us to do. See, chapter six, God, Paul is telling me we need to glorify God. We need to glorify God with our bodies. 
See, we can't be uh, doing all kinds of things. And he was dealing with them and letting them know that they was dealing with sexual immorality. He was letting them know that the body is a temple. He was letting them know that what they're doing with their body is causing hurt and harm to God. See, even now when we look at our society, we we begin to consider and think about and hearing all these things, what people are doing sexually and all the multiple um, um, individuals that they are having in their life, dealing with sexual immorality. In chapter seven, Paul tells them, guess what, the, this, this thing called what we just talked about with sex and how important it is as it relates to marriage versus living in sexual morality. In chapter 8, he, he tells them that they begin to, to tear down arrogance and build up with love. He, he's trying to get them to understand just that. He say you, 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 you when you're arrogant, you tear people down versus love building them all up. In chapter 9, he, he says, do not do things that will cause your brother or sister to fall if they're weak. See, it was all about our actions. It was all about our motives. It, Paul is trying to get them to examine themselves as it relates to communion. See, knowing that, that we have to examine Ourself, knowing that we need to begin to do a change, a shift in our lives, knowing that God truly does have the right plan, the best plan for us. But we have to examine ourselves. We, we need to have a desire to have a change and to move in the direction that God has called us to walk in. See, there are some people who have been in church 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 plus years. And my daughter and I was talking about this earlier saying they are still in the same grade. See, sometimes we have to realize, are we growing, maturing in the faith of God? Or are we okay with staying in the same grade? See, you would say something was wrong with me. If I started pre-kindergarten at the age of five, four or five, and now I'm 50 plus and I'm still in pre-kindergarten, you would say something must be wrong with him. Either he don't want to learn, he's not trying to learn, or he doesn't care about learning. See, we, Paul was trying to get them to understand that they have to check themselves. Y'all, y'all hear me? Amen. Amen's pew. Amen. Um, TV up here. Amen. Um, um, the, the, the stand, amen. The candles. I, 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 I'm talking to myself. I, I understand that y'all may not get this, but there's some changes that we have to make. God is trying to get you and I to begin to recognize there's some stuff we need to begin to change in the midst of our life. Quit thinking that we're okay. Quit thinking that we're all right. But we have to begin to examine ourselves, check ourselves to line up to what God is asking us to walk in. See, every first Sunday while we was right here at the church, there were some things that we would read before we take communion. And I think sometimes we read them so fast just to get through church service and wonder how much more time we have left before we take communion and we go home. See, but God wants us even then to begin to examine, to look at ourselves. And that was what communion was all about. Every first Sunday, we would say, Almighty God, Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all. We acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins, our wickedness, from which we from time to time must grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against you. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoing. The remembrance of them 
just to remind ourselves of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us, Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and that grant that we may be, re, ever serve and please thee in the newness of life. To the honor and the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, see, we, we begin with this repentance prayer. This, this prayer is examining us. We should not just be saying the words, but taking an inward look and saying in this repentive prayer, we do earnestly repent. And we are sorry for these misdoings. And we have to begin to have a moment of mourning, a grieving for the things that we have done against God by thought, word, and deed, provoking most justly thy wrath in indignation against us. See, we got to begin to have that kind of heart that begin to, to look inwardly and ask God to begin to change our hearts. See, because when we look at this, Paul was dealing with them and telling them that it was a heart issue that's causing division. It's a heart issue that's causing all this selfishness. It's a heart issue that's causing them to do more harm than good. It's a heart issue that's causing them to divide and to reduce. It is a heart issue that's going on in the midst of their lives. But then in point two, he, he, he really tells them that, that they need to look and begin to respond. And point one, they are don't, don't divide or reduce. Point two is you need to look and to respond. When we look at verses 20 through 22, it says, So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat, or when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes? That's what they're saying. To eat or drink? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? See, he's telling them to look at what's going on. See, examine what is happening. Looking at the role that they play in the midst of all that is going on. And to begin to be shift your mind to have a desire to respond. See, we can't get stuck in doing the same old thing, thinking the same old way when we know it's totally wrong. If we begin to look and begin to respond, we begin to realize it's the wrong that we are doing. We got to quit justifying the wrong that we're doing and begin to call it out. I understand everybody doesn't like to get called out on the wrong that they are doing because matter of fact is that some folks will get mad, some folks will get defensive because you're calling out the wrong that they are doing. Matter of fact, they will feel so comfortable comfortable with where they are at, but God is telling them that they need to begin to change. I need to begin to change. I have to begin to look and see what the roles I'm playing as it relates to hurting folks. I have to begin to respond in a different manner that's calling God to, to, to that doing the things God wants me to do. See, some folks get mad, some folks get irritated, and then they'll start blaming and calling out other folks' faults. Have you ever seen somebody who all of a sudden you say, here's some things that you don't you need to change, here's some things you're causing heart, and then all of a sudden they begin to tell you about all the faults of somebody, somebody else. And never wanting to deal with their own issues. See, Matthew 7 says it this way. In chapter 7 and verses 3 to 5, it says, why do you look at the speck and the sawdust in some, at your brother's eye? but pay no attention to the whole big plank that's in yours. How can you say to your brothers, let me, let, me, let, let me get that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a whole plank in your eye? The word in verse 5, it says, you hypocrite, first 
Take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to help your brother remove the speck in their eye. See, the thing about Paul was trying to inform them that they are taking the Lord's Supper. They had to quit trying to shift blame, quit trying to blame it on somebody else, but begin to look at themselves. They had to begin to realize that just because they're wealthy and well off, just because, hear me now, just because they brought all the bread, because they brought all the wine to the sacrament, you know, it, they felt it was one of those BYOB type of things. Don't don't, don't know. Don't act like you too holy that you don't know what B-Y-O-B means. That means bring your own bottle. That's, that's what they was thinking about. They had brought their own bottle. They had brought their own communion. That they, they had it in their own mind that it wasn't about sharing. It's about the party that was about to happen right here. It was about their selfishness. It's about what was going on in the midst of their life. See, they got caught up in the moment of not thinking that what it was going on, what the communion truly meant to them. See, Paul was trying to tell them that it was the night that Jesus was betrayed. He took bread and he broke it and he gave to his disciples. And he says, as oft as you do it, do it in the remembrance of me. See, but these folks, the folks who brought their own bottle, the folks that brought their own communion bread, See, they, 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 the word says is they, they ate it all. They drunk all the wine. See, hear me now that they was about to get turned up doing communion. Oh, they was about to get turned up doing a communion celebration. Oh, it was about some popping bottles in this moment. It was about blaming on the alcohol. When you look at the scripture, hear me now, I'm not trying to make this up. I'm not even making this up. But when you look at verse 21 in the B section, it says, say, as a result, one person remained hungry and another person got drunk. See, the thing about it, it was all about them. It's all about their crew. It's all about those who was with them that was part of this party. And God was warning them to not be selfish. Now, here's the thing is, truth be told, we all can be a little selfish. Now, so we can't beat you all up or beat myself up because truth be told, we all have moments of being selfish. There's moments we want to have it done our way because we feel our way is the right way. I know I'm going to talk about some few small things we feel that might be our way. We may want the toilet paper on top and some may want it coming from the bottom. We may want to have some folks put the dishwasher with the handle with the forks and the spoons with the handle down while some don't care if the handle is up. We know that there's some folks who wash dishes and fill the whole sink up with some dishwasher and then begin to wash all the dishes while some folks decide, you know what, I'm going to use dishwasher soap on each and every item. So when we're talking about this, yes, that's some small things, but don't you know we want it our way? And Paul was telling the Corinthian church about something bigger, something that concerns something about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this matter was about, that was going on, was hurting God's heart. See, that's what he was trying to get them to understand. And what they was doing was about, it was in the moments of hurting God's heart. He's letting them know that this godly, sacred moment that, was, that they turned it and made it about them. They, they began to be selfish. They began to feel this privilege that they had. They was ungrateful attitude that was going on in the midst of a communion celebration. See, this act of selfishness. But Philippians 2 tells us this. See, don't do anything out of selfish admissions or feign conceit, but rather in humility, value others above yourself. See, the Lord's Supper is a time when we can remember Jesus' selflessness. And when we begin to realize his selfless Ness. We can look at what he's done for us and we can check ourselves because we don't line up to what he's doing. 
See, when we see the situation, when we see what's going on, when we have to remind ourselves, we got to check our ourselves, our attitudes, our, 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 our motives that is going on. See, it wasn't about this situation. And we see, we need to understand. We have to begin to look at it through the lenses that God has lined up for them. See, that's what Paul was trying to get them to do was to look through the Lord's lens and know what he's done for them. See, he was reminding them that you have to check yourself. See, Paul was saying that this moment was so important. It was so crucial that Christ died for you and I, that we might be saved. It's that moment of celebration, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's that moment in which we see Jesus knowing that he laid it all on the line. He took on the sins of the whole world. And because of all that he has done, we should want to do better. We shouldn't want to be the same as we was last year. We shouldn't want to be the same as we was last month. You should not want to be the same as you was last week. You shouldn't want to be the same as you was yesterday. Matter of fact, you shouldn't want to be the same as you was when you woke up this morning. So Paul was trying to re- let them know that you need to not divide or to reduce. He was letting them know that you need to look and you need to respond. He was letting them know that here's the good news. You can ask and you can receive. He was giving them some good news. Oh, he understood. He knew where they was at. He knew what was going on. But you need to know that there's some good news in the midst of what's happening in the midst of our lives. Oh, we can look at our wrong. We can look at how far left we have gone. But don't you know that there's some good news that we can ask and we shall receive? Don't you know that every first Sunday, there's something that we say. We, I have to say the collect now responds. The, the collect now respond. I, there's a response from the crowd. There's a response from you that's on the other side. There's a response now. It, it says, Almighty God, unto whom our hearts, hearts are open and all desires known and from whom no secret is hid. Oh, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. See, our prayer is to ask God to cleanse our thoughts, to cleanse our hearts, to clean our minds in order that we would do what God has asked us to do. And knowing that when we come to him, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins. Oh, we can be just like uh, David in Psalm 51. He says it in this way. Oh, have mercy upon me, oh God, according to your loving kindness, according to your multitude and your tender mercy. Blot out all my transgressions. Transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from your, my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. See, and then there's some more. He says, for I will acknowledge my transgressions and my sins is always before me against you, O God, and you only I have sinned and done these evil things in your sight that you have found to be just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I have brought forth, I was brought forth in iniquities, and in sins my mother conceived me. Behold, you desires yet, O God, truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom. So purge me with his sub- and I shall be cleansed. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness in thy bones. You have broken my rejoice. Hide your face, not from my sins, and but blot out all my iniquities, O God. Create in me a clean heart in a renewed spirit. See, he was trying to get 
them to understand. Paul is trying to get you and I to understand that we can come before a God who can turn some stuff around in the midst of our lives. Oh, we might have been ones who was divided and reducing, causing people to be driven away. Oh, we might have been ones that we need to look and we have to respond. But don't you know we can ask God and he begins to change and make and mold and cleanse each and every last one of us. Oh, the word tells us that we have to examine ourselves before we begin to take this communion. When we look at this, we have to realize there's always some good news. There's always some good news of how God desires his children to come back unto him. See, it's not about just partaking in some bread and some juice. It's not about that, but it's about coming to a God. It's about allowing him to cleanse us up. It's about seeking him and doing it in the remembrance of him. Or we can come to him and tell him if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So we have to examine ourselves. Lamentation says, let us examine ourselves and test them and let us return to the Lord. Psalms 119 says, and 59 says this, I have considered my ways and I have turned my steps to your status. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commandments. Romans 12, 2 says, we can't be transformed or conformed no longer to the patterns of this world, but we had to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. See, that's the thing about it. We got to give ourselves back on. To God. See, when we give ourselves back unto God, when we ask of him and he's one who will hear our response and also as a re, are we repenting, he also forgives us of our sins. See, we, he looks beyond our faults, our issues and meets us right where our needs is. God loves us through it all and he never ever gives up on us. See, God, I just stopped by here to tell you this morning, this, this morning right here, to remind you that we have to look towards God because he's the one that can turn our situation around. He's the one, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Beloved, that doesn't mean when we look at it that he forgives us of our sin and it's all okay. It does not mean that God's standards have dropped because his standards is still yet holiness. Because he tells us to be holy for thou art holy. But when you look at that, you have to say, I don't know how I can hold up to the standards that God has placed in my head, that God has placed in his word. But don't you know when you look at his word, even though he has this standard, don't you know he's one who can help you through the midst that you find yourself at? Oh, the word tells us that when we are weak, we are now made strong in him. Oh, we can trust in the Lord when we're weak because he can turn some things around. Oh, we can trust in the Lord because the Lord is my strength and my shield. Oh, my heart trusts in him. And I, I know that he's able to help me through it all. So therefore, I will always rejoice. Therefore, I will always sing a song of praise unto him. I will sing, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, when I trust in the Lord, oh, I know he's my keeper. When I trust in the Lord, no matter what slippery slope I found myself in, I know that because he's with me, I can call out into his word and it says in his word, Word. Now unto him who can keep me from stumbling and present me faultless, even though I find myself on a slippery slope, wanting to do wrong because it's right there in front of me. But don't you know the word tells me that he helped to keep me from stumbling. Oh, the word reminds me, even in the midst of what I'm experiencing, in the midst of my pulling and the, well, the sin that's happening in my heart, God says, I give you an exit sign in order Order that you may be escaping from what you're seeing. See, the Lord wants to carry you from 
your mistakes to living a miraculous life. Oh, God wants to carry you and to guide you from foolish living to walking in favor. Oh, God wants to do some miraculous things in the midst of your life, but you got to begin to turn to him. You got to begin to ask God that I need you to do a change in the midst of my life because without you, I can do nothing. Then the Lord wants to entrust you with living a life that brings you from broke to being a blessing in the midst of your life. But you got to put your hands, you got to put your trust in God. Because most importantly, what God wants to do in the midst of your life is turn you from a sinner to a saved and forgiven. Don't you know he wants to do a great and miraculous thing in your life? But you got to check yourself. You got to respond unto him. He's just waiting on you to do something. He's waiting on you to open your mouth to confess your sins and to move closer unto him. Oh, he's been waiting throughout the years. He's been waiting throughout the pandemic. He's been waiting on you to respond. Don't you know all you got to do is move unto him. Quit staying in your mess. Quit living in your mess, but begin to make a move towards God. Don't you know that he's one who will never leave you, nor shall he forsake you. Oh, he's one who continues to call on your name. Oh, he's one who knocks at the door and he's waiting on you to open it up. And when you open it, don't you know that the word tells us that he will be with you and you will be with him. Oh, the word tells us that there's no way to the father except through the son for he is life. He is that that gives you all that more that you can hold and have an abundantly life. Oh, God wants to do something great in the midst of your life. Oh, he knows you face adversities. He knows you facing some struggles. But don't you know God can part any red sea that you find yourself in? Don't you know that God can knock down any wall that you're struggling with? Don't you know God can destroy any giant in your life? Oh, he's that kind of God. But he's always been waiting on you. It doesn't matter what your age is. If you're 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, 50 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old, 90 years old, 100 years old. And if you haven't given your life to Christ, He's been calling you for a long time. And this is a great time to say, Lord, I'm tired. This is a great time to say, God, I'm sorry. And Lord, I ask that you begin to do a new work in me. Oh, I confess my sin. That's what the word tells you to say that, Lord, I know that you're my savior. You're, you're the only one who could save me. You're the only one who can bring me from where I'm at to a place you desire for me to go. But you know, he's trying to get you from a place to where, you, where you're at right now, at moment, to where he wants you to go. But he's been waiting on you to confess. He's been waiting on you to rededicate your life. See, sometimes we have blamed the circumstances, blame everything else. We are even blame God, but don't do a self-check of ourselves. See, God is saying you got to begin to open your mouth, begin to put your full trust in me, even when it gets dark, even when you see a red sea, even when you see a wall, even when you see a giant, even when you see that there's no way out, I'm still going to trust in you. And God is saying, can you trust in me? You can do that right now. See, the thing about it, God wants you to give your whole heart unto him. We got to check ourselves. Don't blame nobody else, but ask God to change you. And if this is you, I want you to put your comments right in the chat right now. Amen. And because we want to pray for you. We want to pray with you. And here's the other thing. God wants you to grow in his word. He don't want you just to give your life and stay right where you're at, but he wants to move you to where he wants you to go. And the only way we do that, by coming to Sunday school, Bible study, and continuously coming and hearing the word. 
Because the way we can contact people and people can reach out to you and pray with you and pray for you through the midst of where you find your at now moment. And that's what we want for you. And that's what God desires for you. We thank God for his word. And let me pray for those who are struggling right now, who find themselves on the fence right now, who finds themselves in this moment of unsurety, and finds themselves in the moment of, of, I just don't know I can make it through. God is calling me to pray for you right now. Let us pray. Oh God, you know the ones who are watching at this moment, oh God. Lord, you know their circumstance. You know, oh God, the red sea that they're facing. You know the God that the giant that tried to jump in and face them right now. You know the darkness they feel that they may be in the midst of, oh God, or at this very moment. But God, help them to make a decision for you. And God, right now we pray and lift up their certain circumstances and their situations, oh God. And God, we thank you in advance for what you're doing for them right now. We praise you, O oh God. We glorify you for healing. We praise you, O oh God. We, we glorify you for, for the change that you're making in the midst of people's lives right now. We praise you, O oh God, in the midst of some have lost loved ones. But God, you are right there right now at this moment and comforting them and giving them peace. God, we praise you and thank you for all that you are doing in the midst of their lives right now. We thank you. We praise you, O oh God, that you're making a way out of no way, O oh God. We thank you. God right now that you're blessing children and grandchildren and bringing them back unto the fall. We thank you God for those we find in our families who are in prison right now. God we pray we lift them up to you at this moment oh God that you would cover them keep them oh God and help them their minds that be turned back unto you oh God. Oh God we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for this word to remind us to check ourselves and to return back unto you. Oh, God, we praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. We at Lomax, we appreciate your faithful giving. And beloved, I encourage you to continue to sow a seed right into this ministry because we are about doing the work of God. We thank you for all that you continue to do how you bless, the things that you give, because we bless the pantry as we're giving out food. We bless the prison ministry as we're reaching out to individuals. And we bless those right here in our community as well as in our church. So we encourage you to sow a seed in this ministry because it's all about help us doing the work of ministry right here at Lomax Temple, AME Zion Church. And you can give by the following means: by Zale, GiveLify, Cash App, PayPal, and of course, you can always mail your checks right here to 17441 to Quinter Street, Detroit, Michigan, 48212. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to give us a call at 313-893-1463. Not just calling about the offering, but calling also for prayer and requests that you may have in the midst of your life. And as we leave this, 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 this sermon, leaving this worship experience, sometimes we will leave a little too fast. And you need to understand the benediction is about a blessing for you until we come back again. Every day we have, God has been good to us. And no, we have to do some self-examination. We have to check ourselves and that, that we, we fall in line with the word of God, that we may fall in line with the word of God. And as we leave here, may the peace of God that passes all understanding, oh, keep your hearts and your mind centered on Jesus Christ, now and forevermore. And let the people of God say, 
Amen. Amen. And amen.